This meeting is being recorded. So hello everyone, welcome to ConnectCon presented by FTC Team 979 for Wizards.exe. Uh, join us on our magical journey where you can hear from STEM professionals from Google, APL, iRobot and more. My name is Isha Sharma and I will be your host for this session. Please this chat for any questions related to the presentation and we'll address them at the end. Today, we're super honored to have Mr. Peter James from Crystal Clear Automation to speak to us about working with UMD on a smart crosswalk study and many of his technology projects he's working on. Thank you so much for taking the time to present at ConnectCon. Well, thanks for having me and it's uh... I appreciate the opportunity to kind of present what I've been up to and, and outreach to anybody that might want to uh, delve into any of the different projects. Um, I wanted to start off with something a little, uh, I'll share my screen, but uh, let me see, disable share now, host disabled attendee sh sharing. Can you turn my screen oh. sharing on? Yeah, yeah, I just fixed that. Okay, let's see, all righty. This is just to loosen us up a little. to be seeing, uh, and I'll skip my, I'll keep, keep the screen share up, but we're going to see a lot of technology emerging over mostly your lifetimes and a little bit of mine um, that's going to drastically affect um, society, uh, how we get around, how we do things. And um, what I've sort of been focusing is how to, um, to, uh, implement these technologies uh, in the real, into the world world in a shorter period of time than uh, waiting for them. So I'll just start off and go down the list. Um, back in, uh, I think as early as 2000. Uh oh, it's giving me a warning. Uh, starting in 2003, we started putting robotic controls on um, on uh, mowers, this is, happens to be an electric mower at uh, the uh, softball field at Wheaton Regional Park, and it uses something called RTK GPS. And for the uh, smart crosswalk project that I'll get into, we'll be using the same tracking system plus uh, something called ultra wideband. Um, so if you have questions and, and don't understand what uh, the terms I'm using, write them down or put them in the chat. We'll talk, you know, I'll, I'll answer questions. So this is a prototype. Since then, we've put all the electronics into the back uh, of the car. Uh, car. So uh, we, uh, we're looking at uh, students that may want to work on this project. We have a much smaller, friendlier uh, robot um, that's... Uh, Instead of this is a fifteen thousand dollar mower, and they go up to sixty thousand for commercial mowers. And we've started with a two hundred dollar Fisker real mower that I can actually put my hand in without getting cut. So going down our list, um, these are just a compilation of the the more recent projects we've been working on, and uh, then I'll get into some detail on. Um, some of the more interesting things. Um, so in addition, we, we were looking at trying to be, um, to cover all the aspects of taking care of uh, grass and yards. So uh, the count, Montgomery County outlawed uh, 
a couple years back, the use of pesticides on athletic fields and uh, private lawns. And so this is just some um, uh, actually synthetic, uh, what's called convoluted neural network uh, deep learning that actually uh, segments um, uh, uh, some of the machine vision software will just detect something. And then uh, another uh, classification is actually class classifying um, objects. And then uh, there's segmentation, which is just outlining the uh, periphery of an object, and, which is this is. And then um, uh, there's a function of actually tra tracking move movable objects. Luckily, uh, weeds um, move very, very slowly. Uh, so that uh, we don't have to track them. So uh, just uh, I'll just keep moving along. Um, so we're looking for people that want to. The machine vision works pretty well. There's some amount of training as we go to different fields, uh, but this will have a lot of social impact as far as uh, 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 you know uh, uh, addressing the weed issue without having to worry about pesticides. Um, Another technology uh, we have is uh, this is a, a Delta Arm robot, um, and there's uh, maybe more popular are Delta Arm printers, but these are typically found in bakeries and um, um, uh, cook um, candy factories, that sort of thing. Uh, but they're uh, typically very fast. This one was under five hundred dollars to build. Um, and uh, we're going to be actually adding some end effectors to actually build EVs uh, robotically, doing what's called a hand layup um, function. And um, the free electric card project I'll save for later because that's one of our big initiatives right now. Um, and um, And this is our, our, one of our end goals is to introduce personal rapid transit systems. Uh, there's a, co a company called Glideway, which is, this is one of their mock-up films. Um, and right now, uh, Montgomery County in Maryland are like the, the second worst uh, congested areas in the nation. And uh, we believe uh, the implementation of these personal rapid transit systems will not only eliminate congestion, but um, the only way you're going to reach both the state and the county have declared a uh, resolution for uh, becoming uh, vision uh, zero uh, jurisdictions, which means no deaths or serious injuries from um, uh, our road system. And, and that's, um, to me, not a sincere pledge without considering um, the transportation systems. And, and we think that the key uh, to reaching a vision zero is to separate, you know, very heavy, fast moving vehicles from, you know, uh, light squishy humans, because the two, when they collide, the vehicle typically wins. Um, and uh, this is one of the solutions uh, that we're proposing, uh, both to Maryland and Montgomery County and other jurisdictions. We keep kind of... So going back to the, uh, hey, we the see it. this is plant a seed. this is a wire bot. Picks up a seed from different seed bins. We just go one there, runs. I don't know if you guys can you guys see that? Second row hole, pretty much exactly. So we think we got a pretty good. Makings for a cedar, here. So if you go into a modern factory, particularly auto factories, uh, you'll see these big multi-million dollar robots moving cars and things around. Um, this is a, a, a wire bot that could stretch the entire uh, space of a factory with four winches and be able to move uh, uh, materials and, and even finished cars much more efficiently than uh, the kind of robotics they use now. So we just use 
fishing line, we may have to go to you know metal uh, wires uh, to lift a, a 500 to 1,000 pound uh, vehicle. But um, uh, this is some of the technology that um, uh, I call them sloppy robots, but it's looking at producing what normally costs you know hundreds of thousands of dollars for uh, you know in the thousand dollar arena uh, to perform the same function. And a lot of it has to do with physics. If you, uh, I, I assume everybody's seen six axis robot arms um, and you see a lot of those in auto factories, big, huge ones. And, uh, but they have uh, long lever arm forces. So they require a lot of energy and a lot of force. Whereas if you lift something from directly above it, um, the uh, amount of energy to move it is, is much less. And then um, I'll go into just a little bit because um, it touches on the um, the study we're doing. We all of our robots uh, have a first-person video where you can use your cell phone and your thumbs to, to drive it around remotely. Uh, one of the applications we wanted to provide for the um, uh, smart crosswalk uh, testing is the ability to gamify to have pretty much anybody to get online and uh, put themselves in the, in the virtual seat of one of the cars running on the test track and even under simulation and um, uh, uh, test what everybody's reaction time to both the signs and whether or not and how fast they see pedestrians you know, uh, entering the street. So um, I'm not sure what, okay. So this is a an example uh, for our EV project, this is a, a hub motor, um, which uh, we'll have two of them. And uh, although on the ones driven by humans, we'll have, probably have a steering wheel and a classical, but most of our robots have what's called differential steering, which I'm sure you guys have worked on. And uh, so we have a basically a, a thumb control on all of our robots and this is a, a hub motor that will probably go into a very large delivery robot or a small um, uh, EV. It it's about a two Stops. kilowatt. It's roughly about eight well, times more powerful than like braking. hoverboard okay. wheels. And then uh, we sort of played around and done some prototype in the area of what's called smart robots. I mean, soft robots. And uh, this is uh, just uh, uh, rubber fingers that are inflated with air to close. And um, because we were doing uh, some robotics uh, handling um, vegetables for uh, uh, smart greenhouses. Uh, we we kind of dabbled with making some soft robots, but for for handling uh, materials, and there's a whole um, effort to uh, actually um, uh, do patient care um, and allow, uh, and also the field of prosthetics uh, that would, uh, you know, provide uh, um, uh, prosthetic limbs where you can grab something without worrying about, you know, uh, bruising someone or whatever. Um, so I don't know what that was. That's not, that's not my website. Get rid of that. Um, and then uh, I needed to, well, we started to cut, uh, here it is. Um, we started to cut um, lettuce floats with a, um, CNC router and filled up the room with uh, dust, uh, styrofoam dust. So uh, we looked at using a laser to cut the holes in the styrofoam to make floats. We had an 80 foot float pool uh, where we raised uh, uh, vegetables by just uh, putting the plants in um, on, on styrofoam floats. And uh, this is uh, the pricing for a uh, what four axis laser cutter was 
40,000. So um, I checked in the coffer, we didn't quite have that. So, so I spent about 500 bucks and got a, I think this is a two or six watt laser. So it goes pretty slow, but it basically goes out and, and cuts, um, cuts the foam and it cuts it at, a, at an angle so that it's bevel. So the little rock wool cubes that the plants are in won't fall through. Um, and uh, this, of course, with a uh, fiber labor 2000, we're, we're looking at uh, building something similar. This is a four foot by eight foot table. Um, and uh, we'd be looking at building something um, uh, maybe at a couple hundred watts or a couple thousand watts to actually do the trimming of the um, uh, laminate for the, for the EVs and other robots and production. And uh, just a short, we have played around with drones, but um, there's nothing really active. I just thought I, for you guys that like drones, here's a, we've uh, tested out about uh, half a dozen autonomous um, drones and certainly have had a number of them fly off on their own <laughs> for no, no reason. But um, uh, so if there's any uh, interest in, in uh, applications, I'm open to talking to any, anybody that wants to do drone applications. We, we still have a few of them sitting around uh, here. And um, one area, um, that I'll go into a little bit more is um, the use of uh, genetic algorithms. It's a, a field of uh, artificial intelligence that just uses um, good old um, uh, evolution to uh, evolve uh, systems that, that work better than the previous generation. So this just happens to be some bipedal uh, creatures that were taught to walk, um, and you'll see the 999th uh, generation, you know, out, outperforms all the rest of them. So we're looking to apply this to um, uh, finding the best bus routes or the best travel routes, um, maybe even uh, optimizing things like zoning. Um, uh, and th there's a lot of there's a lot of problems, particularly in transportation and urban planning that have uh, too many variables. They're multivariant problems. And it's, it's silly to think that humans could solve these kind of classes of problems. So um, genetic algorithms is one approach. We're also talking to D-Wave, which has a quantum annealer about using it for optimization of traffic and urban planning problems. Um, digital twins um, is sort of a foundation that we're looking to build on, uh, both for, for the existing um, project for Smart Crosswalk. This is a, a, a digital twin of an intersection at Randolph and Neville Road. And the white um, translucent pyramid is actually a traffic camera uh, uh, with machine vision built into it. And what we're doing is uh, actually working to collect uh, 3D meshes of the entire, starting with Montgomery County and then going out to uh, the state and the rest of the world and doing high resolution uh, digital uh, uh, 3D uh, meshes of our streets and creating a digital twin. And the idea of a digital twin uh, would be to allow you to test and uh, simulate uh, things like personal rapid transit systems or things that are, really aren't going to see the light of day just because it costs so much to do a pilot and a lot of engineering effort. So what we're doing for the, and I'll start, I'll go into the smart crosswalk study. Um, what the state of Maryland, uh, the state highway administration is looking for is to, um, to evaluate all the different technologies, cameras, radars, LIDARs and all those things that are typically used for smart intersections or smart crosswalks to see how uh, these technologies would apply to more mid-block. 75% um, of the um, crashes uh, involving pedestrians are at night and I think 72% are at um, non-signalized intersections. 
So that's really the focus of what we're doing for this uh, smart intersection study. And it, it will get uh, anybody, uh, what I'm looking for is some of the robotics teams to use their McKenna wheel platforms to help us um, uh, work with that. And because um, there's a big chip shortage out there, we only maybe, okay. oh, this is an ultra wide band. <laughs> I don't know if we have to go to this. came up with for MPA was uh, to develop a communication-based train control system that used connected vehicles and ultra-wideband. In New York City, throughput of trains is limited by the amount of trains you can move through a system at one point. And that limiting factor is really the block system that's installed today. To, 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 but that, actually, that uh, Robert James is my baby brother. <laughs> so... Uh, he um, actually is uh, pretty well known in the industry for being a, a, a grandfather of uh, or father of connected vehicles. And uh, some of the technologies he's introduced like to the subways of New York is um, what's called ultra wideband. And that's useful for positioning when you're, you can't get access um, a good signal uh, from a, a GPS satellite. So in tunnels or in urban canyons, um, you would use something like this. We, be, just because we want to get a lot of vehicles out on the test site, which right now, the last email I got back from uh, Lake Forest said we can probably use their parking lot. So we'll be setting up a, a closed test site uh, there. Um, and we want to try to get as many uh, of the clubs that would uh, provide a, uh, a platform, uh, probably a McKenna wheel. We have some other platforms to put uh, mannequins and and uh, bikes and that sort of thing on. And so now I'll go into first starting with the smart uh, crosswalk technology. So this is a little, um, what we wanna do is um, be able to take um, different vendors equipment and put m these pieces of equipment at uh, the same uh, side, the same road scenario so we can match them side by side and then put uh, different amounts of traffic um, through that, th those, uh, through the areas that the sensors cover. So for each sensor, we want to build the three-dimensional field of view. And then what we want to do is, um, and amazingly, this guy is just a leftover skeleton from Halloween and we put him on a McKenna wheel platform and the uh, uh, YOLO 5 software, which is a machine vision uh, deep learning software, was thinks at least 78% of the time that it's a, a person. So we think uh, we need to uh, make good enough looking mannequins and uh, that, that these different vendors will you, uh, recognize as humans and, and as bicyclists and, and cars. We'll have, we have a commitment from one autonomous vehicle company called SteerTech that will show up um, at least for some period of time with a car and one or two engineers to help out. Um, this is uh, essentially the RTK GPS, and I can answer any questions about what RTK is, but RTK is a high precision GPS, and it usually typically uh, gives you a one centimeter accuracy. Um, so the the red in this case is the one centimeter. Um, the yellow lines uh, is where uh, the rover uh, lost track of the uh, of the satellite. Didn't the sink lost sink, and it's uh, will wander, you know, maybe up to ten centimeters. Uh, so we want to replicate this tracking system with uh, the ultra wideband, uh, which instead of being about four hundred dollars per uh, robot is uh, $25 per robot for a tag. Um, a lot shorter range, uh, but we're seeing the new uh, um, Samsung and the new, the higher end uh, Apple phone both have ultra wideband built into them and Apple selling ultra wideband tags for $25 a piece. And this is the, you know, looking at basically tra tracking everyone everywhere, which is kind of scary in itself. 
Um, so I guess um, I'm going to go before I go on too much further. Can I break for some questions? Is that allowed? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We can give you some questions. OK. So you know the delta arm? Uh, we've seen claws, I think, in FTC like the delta arm. Can you explain a bit more about how the delta arm works? Like, how is the delta arm mounted? And is it mounted to the ceiling? Yeah, well, maybe I can stop sharing. Did you stop my sharing? Or oh, I need to do that? OK, because I can walk over here and actually show you what one looks like, or that one looks like. Uh, these are, they make delta arm printers and it uses essentially the same principle. This is uh, just uh, 3D printed and we went out and purchased. So does anybody see that? Yeah, we can see it, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Some other, some other pieces. Uh, so yeah, this is, um, so you've got three arms. These are just uh, probably sailboat type servos. My. Yeah, these are sailboat servers. There's three of them. This is a 3D printed piece. And then these are probably not put together as well as I'd like, but these are carbon fiber rods. And then uh, you put whatever type of end effector on the bottom, depending what, what your work piece is. So we're looking at right now, there's seven students at University of Maryland. They've chosen to take one of these delta arms and make a uh, what's called a toe steering um, we looked at how we could disrupt the auto industry by not having to pay $100 million to tool up a factory. So um, we're looking to use uh, Delta Arms to do the hand layup work that's typically done like in boat manufacturer, boat makers. They lay up, whether it's fiberglass or carbon fiber, they lay it up by hand and we're actually developing robots to do that, um, to try to drive the cost of um, fabrication of electric vehicles and, and our other robots. So um, go ahead with the questions. Side question on that. Um, you said it's six axis robot arm. Could you specify like what is a six axis robot arm? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Sometimes, you know, if you assume, let's say, um, But if you look at uh, videos of Tesla factories or BMW, let me see. If you want to, you can share your screen. I'm going to go back to the, hold on. I'm, I'm just pulling it up. Between your lawn and a true lawn. <laughs> true green lawns are treated to be healthy from tip to root. Your lawn, not so much. That's because every True Green Lawn Specialist brings a truck. So this is um, some of these layup robots that have been being worked on at, um, and I don't know, uh, that is that end effector, the roller is on a six axis arm. And I was hoping that we could see the whole arm, but I don't know if that's going to be the case. Nope. So let's look at one at the at Tesla factory. Yeah. Well, these are all six axis arms, but I was hoping to find. Oh, here's one. So these are, I, I think this is a Tesla factory. Yeah. So typically, um, so 
So if you look at, uh, did everybody get a good, good view of a? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So you'll see these in BMW, McLaren, uh, uh, a lot of factories, and it seems like these industrial designers who ever chose these didn't must have fallen asleep in physics 101 class because I always learned, you know, the longer the the arm from the fulcrum, the more uh, force you need to, to kind of keep it up in the air. So um, our approach is to suspend the weight on, underneath the, the center of gravity of the robot rather than when you produce these, you know, you, you need to pick up heavy parts um, and uh, have a long lever arm, then you need a whole lot of power, which translates to bigger motors and a whole lot of money. And we think there's more cost effective and energy effective ways of, you know, fabricating, uh, in our case, electric vehicles. So I um, hope that answers the questions. Um, okay, can I, uh, you want to keep giving me or do you want me to go through the chat? Oh, we can keep giving them to you. How do you, so where do you see your robots and projects implemented in the future? Well, we've been invited down by the Tampa uh, airport and they have uh, a total of four airports they want to partner with. So having the robotic mowers out uh, mowing first, uh, like uh, closed sites, like uh, airports, uh, median strips on highways, long runs of uh, utility right-of-ways um, and, uh, and of course athletic fields because they're, they're flat open sky um, is, is just one application. Uh, what, we're, what I wanted to talk about a little bit in this uh, meeting was uh, the idea of implementing digital twins in order to simulate in very fine detail and, and, and using real-time data or smart city data coming from street lights or roadways or wh wherever to actually be able to uh, let the public actually both be to the designers. Um, has uh, anybody played Sim City by any chance or familiar with the game? No, I'm not. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So if you, if you Google Sim City, you can get a, a picture, but it's basically a, a game um, where you um, become an urban designer and uh, similar to Farmville, which was a popular game uh, of building farms. So right now, in order to, we feel that the big bottleneck of these technologies emerging and people getting the benefits of them is just the ability to um, understand them from our planners and leaders. I've run into so many brick walls <laughs> with these technologies because people don't even know. Um, like the personal rapid transit, we asked that it would be included in the quarter uh, 270 studies, quarter Ford study, that the county's looking at transportation up to Frederick, you know, to relieve the 270 uh, traffic burden. And they, they said they, they couldn't evaluate it because they didn't know what it was and they'd have to hire a consultant that they couldn't afford to figure it out. So um, I'm, I've got a lot of my focus now on building these digital twins to be able to show not just uh, planners and, and political leaders, but the public on, on how these things would, if they were implemented on their street, you know, what, what would the impact be? And, um, and what I envision is a combination of AI and uh, quantum computers generating optimal versions of these different systems, but also including um, citizens in uh, defining whether they want a uh, strip mall there or a park or um, maybe a, a certain type of transit system to allow them to make the decisions in, in a kind of a 3D kind of game, gamified uh, uh, world. And um, uh, one of the, like one of the issues I'm running in with 
trying to get vendors. Uh, the big vendors will provide us loaners of their smart crosswalk technology, but some of maybe even the better technologies coming out of small firms and they just can't afford to be loaning, you know, for, for three or four months equipment or, or, or they won't. So by uh, what we're doing now is um, going around and using something called structure for motion to um, capture and scan uh, the roadways. Um, and then, and then we'll, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with augmented reality, but we will, on our test site, we'll, we will overlay these different high injury networks around, starting with the county, onto that physical space, and then um, provide sort of a, um, a gamification interface to have volunteer drivers actually drive around in cars um, or maybe take the role, put them in the in the uh, eyeballs of the mannequins that are running around, and and see what their reaction times. If uh, did they notice, you know, did they notice the car coming, or did they notice the pedestrian? And then, um, so we want to be able to uh, use the power of these digital twin technologies to um, to evaluate millions of scenarios um, in this tape same amount of time frame and and at much lower cost than actually doing uh, things uh, uh, um, uh, manually i guess at a test site so um did that answer the question by that did so uh do you think styrofoam floats would help solve both the global hunger and part of the plastic crisis, because a lot of the poorest and most hungry communities and some of the more less sanitary ones have landfills near them. So what do you think about that? Well, the thing is, well, that, that's getting a bit far afield. I mean, we were looking at using our Delta arm robots and some other robots to, to do recycling, but I think a lot of the, the, if you go down, uh, and this is probably for another discussion, is that you know I I don't think uh, plastics are a good thing just even to allow on the streets because uh, we're told that they're getting recycled, but if you trace them back, there's mountains of these, like you said, landfills, you know, mountains of plastic um, that can't be recycled. Aluminum cans are about the only thing where it makes sense from a, a carbon footprint to recycle, um, but China start, stopped taking glass. Um, we, have, we think robotics will come in by um, performing a lot of the reuse and recycling in the neighborhood or even in the home. So one of the things we do now is we have a bunch of diesel trucks that drive around and pick up yard waste and, and, um, and take it up to Dickerson and compost and we think that there's a lot of fallacies out there that the government promotes or and uh, like composting. We're told that, oh, composting is a good thing. But if you simply break down the analysis of where all the mass goes, so you get uh, maybe 40 to 60% of the mass is water. Um, but the, uh, you know, up probably about two thirds of the carbon and 80% of the nitrogen ends up either going, well, the carbon goes in the atmosphere along with a good portion of the nitrogen. And nitrogen in the form of nitrous um, oxides, laughing gas, um, that is 300 times worse than carbon as far as uh, retaining uh, heat in the, in the atmosphere. Um, so make sure you guys write down the, the nitrogen uh, cycle crisis because I think that's far worse than the carbon crisis. But I would, I would look at, um, I think we can apply technology to um, say render um, food and yard waste in, in neighborhoods or at home. And then we've done some projects where we've had, we've had I've had two capstone design teams at Maryland and one at um, senior, a group of seniors at uh, Poolsville High School, which is uh, in the global ecology um, uh, magnet, uh, and they produced uh, in-vessel composters, where we took all of the carbon that came off the pile and fed it to plants in the greenhouse, and then so we we don't allow that escape to the atmosphere, and then we 
about halfway through, we throw everything in an anaerobic digester, which produces some methane, but that wasn't our real goal. Our goal was producing a high value liquid um, fertilizer. Um, so I can go on and on about that, that subject. Um, but yeah, I, I just, what we have is economic pressures of finding, uh, if we're gonna replace uh, fossil fuels with uh, batteries, uh, the, the guys that are um, drilling for oil need some place to put their products. So it's g going more and more into plastics. And that's something that's more, I guess, a, a political thing, but um, uh, we, we don't know. Um, as far as making our car sustainable, we're looking at, instead of using petrochemical um, resins in epoxies, we're looking at using just like PLA type um, uh, organic binders that would come from um, uh, agricultural waste and things like that. So, um, so thank you. That really does answer the question, I think. So the next one is, uh, can you go into a bit more detail on, uh, you showed us like that evolution model, um, you know, of the okay. generation. Uh, can you go into a bit of detail on how you combine evolution and urban planning? Because that's sort of, those fields are kind of different. So it's interesting to see that overlap. Okay. Um, is, am I still sharing? Yep, you are. So in the case of um, optimizing a, a personal rapid transit system, uh, the, the first thing that you look at is how can, um, and, uh, how can I um, uh, optimize the placement of the stations to try to get um, maximize the ridership? So uh, putting uh, stations where the maximum amount of people are within, say, a quarter mile walking distance. And in order to um, tackle the problem of um, uh, transportation equity, um, there's a lot of society that is uh, constrained to very small areas because they can't afford a car um, or they're disabled. Um, so a lot of effort in, in uh, urban planning side is how do we create um, transportation systems that provide equity? So this is a quarter study that um, the uh, head of the MTA said they would include it in their quarter study. And then he left and the kind of their, his uh, team that was left behind kind of reneged on that. But this is a, a, a quarter uh, study going on in the Baltimore area. It goes from Ellicott City over to the Bayview Hospital. And what you're looking at, can everybody see that? Yep. Okay, so um, all the blue lines are um, streets and we'll probably eliminate streets that are dead ends um, that only take uh, streets. But So the idea would be um, we start out with a random number generator that says, you know, puts the maximum. So we want to have uh, maybe 20 to 50 stations total. And it goes around and uh, we have some algorithms that will randomly generate GPS locations and put them, find the nearest street in a 90 degree. It uses, uh, uh, finds the, the, the line closest to the point. Uh, algorithm basically, and randomly puts um, uh, stations around here. And then we're trying to get our hands on uh, per, uh, high resolution um, census bureau data that can tell us what's say the average income of a household in this uh, geographical center to see how much, um, you know, how, how, how many people that will typically not have a car um, to optimize it. So what a genetic algorithm does, it randomly generates, say, 50, you know, maybe there's 10 different uh, uh, designs in this generation. So it'll randomly populate the stations. Um, 
connecting the stations is not too much of a problem, but that's a second layer. Um, and so based on the amount of uh, ridership potential and the transportation equity, um, it may also be the availability of right of way. So data would be added to not just the uh, the streets, but you know who owns who owns the street, or if there's all the red lines here are uh, rail right of ways. So there would be some costing involved of um, you know where. So so the idea is to auto generate a um, uh, a guideway, and uh, here's one. Sorry about this, guys. So the idea would be to um, auto-generate um, these, uh, whether it's a bus route or a, a highway, or in our case, we're pushing the personal rapid transit because we think it's so much better than anything else. Um, that we would generate these designs and then the system would come back and um, evaluate this design. Uh, so the way a genetic uh, algorithm works is just like uh, evolving a living thing is that um, the genes get mixed together and they come out with the offspring. And then um, the fitness test would be for people or animals is the Darwinian fitness test of whether or not you're going to survive. In the case of uh, computer um, genetic algorithms, uh, the programmer defines what they, they're they looking as a fitness test. So for transportation, it may be, you know, what's, what's, and they may put different weights on the fitness test, like how much does it cost? Um, how long will it take to build? Uh, wh what are the, um, how many, uh, people, uh, how much ridership can it take? Um, and, and like I said, the optimal layout of the stations to have the, the maximum impact um, on actually getting transportation to people that don't, don't have it. So that's, so each generation, uh, the, the design that gets generated then gets compared to the other designs and say the top 10% of the winners, then, then their uh, criteria that defines how they were, they were design was generated would be um, uh, crossed together to have a next generation of offspring. So in the case of using these, um, like the Austin University, I think had 1.15 out of the last six uh, RoboCup challenges using a genetic algorithm. And it would basically, the, the thing would automatically alter the length of the robot's stride, the width of the stride, how it swung its arm, and how it reacted to visual cues as far as tracking the ball. And, and, uh, and so uh, there's a similar approach then to trying to use these things to optimize uh, you know, transportation systems. I've probably read about a couple dozen papers where researchers have applied it to optimizing the bus routes. Um, so, you know, Montgomery County right now is redoing their, their entire ride on bus system. And genetic algorithms would be great to use for that because it would um, take, you know, the limited amount of buses. I think there's maybe 90 buses or so, and it would run them through just thousands or millions of possible bus routes until it slowly converged on um, the optimal bus routes that are going to serve the most amount of people um, and probably, you know, at the least operating costs. Does that make any sense? It does. It does. It's really interesting. So um, quick questions about the digital twins. Um, two things, uh, where does the name digital twins come from and how do you keep the digital twins accurate? That'll be your last question. Yeah, well, um, digital twins were first started at NASA because the cost of putting prototypes up into space to test them under real conditions were quite expensive. And uh, so, uh, and then it, it, 
it, so I'm not sure who coined the term. That, you know, maybe you want to look through some NASA records. Um, but then also the uh, nuclear power industry, it was very, they, they had a problem of being, they were, the regulators wouldn't let them introduce any new technologies for, for 20 years or whatever, just because they were so fearful of it failing and bringing down, you know, power plants. So, uh, and then the aerospace was the third industry to adopt it um, because of the cost of, um, well, the influence of NASA, but also the cost of these billion dollar planes or whatever, um, being able to test out different things without, um, you know, crashing them. Um, so the, uh, the, a, a digital twin uh, to be effective should have real time data feeding it. Um, so in the case of we're talking to one, um, uh, smart city, there's about 10 smart cities that has spent a lot of effort to put, uh, internet of thing sensors around. So you really should start with, um, say for a road system where you have at e each intersection, you have d uh, data collectors that are collecting in real time, you know, what the traffic flow is, um, what the weather is and, and other things. So having a digital twin that is effective, you'd want as much real time data uh, to be able to simulate your solution in, in real time against real traffic. Um, and, and so that's your second part of your question is, yeah, it's important, but not necessarily necessarily for certain things. Um, right now, the Montgomery County is going through this Thrive 2050, where they want to significantly modify um, uh, zoning. And the idea or the stated goal is to try to create more affordable housing. And there's quite a bit of contention. And so I think a digital twin would be very valuable for citizens to go and actually see what the effect of a, um, a you know, a 300 foot apartment building would be next to their single family house, as far as the viewscape and traffic and load on schools uh, requirement, you know, the infrastructure required. Um, so, um, even without the real time feedback, um, there's a lot of things that society could, um, I think benefit from by democratizing that whole process. A lot of people don't probably don't know what 2005 thrive 2050 even is, or haven't heard about it. And for like for the quarter, uh, the quarter Ford study, we have a million people in Montgomery County. They only surveyed 150 people as to what they wanted in transportation systems. So I think there's a big need of getting these digital twins out and we're looking at putting them, making them sort of like a Pokemon Go game that is, you know, localized so that we can define, you know, what's going on and look at, do we want to do recycling in the neighborhood or do we want to have a bunch of diesel trucks coming in and being without spending a whole bunch of money on pilots um, just be able to evaluate, you know, different solutions and open up the um, the ideas to all the citizenry to, to allow citizens to make suggestions that maybe nobody thought of, but maybe are great solutions. Hope that answered the digital twin. Um, so if anybody wants to help build a digital twin, I just scanned, there's a high incident network of uh pedestrian accidents right here on Quince Orchard Boulevard um, next to the two, uh, west of 270. So I just scanned that yesterday and um, uh, there's a, a, um, a, a request for information, uh, interest rather from uh, Trenton, New Jersey, and they wanna put in a, a pilot of a hundred autonomous vehicles and I happened to find online a guy who's uh, got a compilation, uh, about 40 videos of him and others just driving around Trenton. So um, there's a technology called Structure from Motion where you can just take photos and recombine them and produce 3D meshes. Um, so if anybody wants to work on that project, I've got a, they can remote in, I've got a 
24 core, um, um, I'm uh, 24 core. Is it 20? Yeah, it's a, I'm sorry. It's a, um, a, a 12 core, 24 thread um, Intel server here um, that we're looking at actually implementing some of these flows to take huge amounts of data through to, you know, to start creating these, uh, at least parts of the digital twins. So that's really very interesting. And I'm sure my team would love to do that. Uh, sounds like a super great opportunity, but I'm afraid we've run out of time today. So okay. if anyone has any more questions regarding this presentation, uh, please email them to us and we will forward them to Mr. James. ConnectCon continues soon with Miss Amy Diagostino and Miss Nia Hughes with the fireside with the fireside chat with two human factors psychologists. If you would like to be informed about more events and videos by our team, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on our Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and check us out on our website at the links below. Uh, thank you again, Mr. James, uh, for presenting at ConnectCon. Uh, it was certainly a super interesting discussion and it was super unique to anything we'd seen before in ConnectCon. And your projects are really amazing. I wish you the best of luck on those and I'm sure we'll be in contact. So thanks so much everyone for attending the presentation today and we'll see you